I would like to apologize for the quality of audio in this video. Although I have a degree in audio engineering from the Berklee College of Music, I plugged the microphone into the headphone jack of the recorder. Okay, let's get started. Hi everyone, my name is Joe Barnard. You just saw the sixth attempt at landing the Echo test vehicle. It's sort of a rocket, uh, but it gets dropped from a drone, tries to land on the ground using a solid propellant motor that is a motor which cannot be throttled. And uh, there's actually a seventh attempt that I will also show in this video, but before we get to that, we need to talk a little bit more about what happens during this test number six. Previously, there have been five attempts at getting this Echo vehicle on the ground. If you look over here at the playlist, these are all of the attempts, one, two, three, four, five. Number four was absolutely the closest, coming very close to the ground, hovering just a bit, and then tipping over because of a little bit of horizontal velocity and a little bit of bounce from those legs. I've got Adobe Premiere open on my computer, so let's take a look at this test from several different angles. Here's the footage from the tracking cam you just saw. The vehicle comes up to thrust, ignites the motor, and you can start to see some thrust vector control happening. We've also got some horizontal control, which is why the vehicle is pitching back and forth to try and make sure it stays in the same place, not sliding left or right. The vehicle hovers about a meter above the ground, then falls, bounces, and frustratingly tips over. Here's an angle from a GoPro that I had on the ground, which ended up catching the vehicle very close to where it touched down. When we play this clip, you can see the vehicle come into frame, the legs sort of flop out as it does. It starts to slow down right above the ground. It does look like it's tipped a little bit, and we'll see that from another angle soon. It hops for a little bit, and then... Falls over. There it is. It's pretty hard to figure out where to point the cameras on these tests. You would think, ah, oh, just point it straight down under the drone. But because we're not controlling the actual position of the vehicle, only its velocity, sometimes it slides back and forth, which is why the vehicle is close to out of frame here on this GoPro. Here's another angle of the vehicle coming down to the ground. This is shot at 240 frames per second, played back at 10 FPS, which is why the quality is low. It is a very cool test, actually. Let's just reverse back up here. When those legs pop out, you can actually see the TVC mount. You can see the motor wiggle a little bit uh, as the vehicle uh, feels a bunch of vibration. There it goes. So the vehicle comes down to the ground. You can see it pitching back and forth uh, as you can in other angles where it's trying to correct exactly where it is. Um, it sort of stops that horizontal movement, but you'll see it, it is still translating to the side so that when we touch down to the ground, it's got that component to it. And at 240 frames per second, this takes forever. But it finally begins to tip over and there it goes. As a quick reminder, so much of this footage is just in super, super slow motion. So here's a clip from the onboard camera on the vehicle looking down, and this is in real time. This is not sped up. Here we go. So we're hanging from the drone. There's separation. And in about four or five seconds, we're on the ground, uh, having moved from about 30 meters above ground level to zero. So we can take a look at this footage and say, all right, this is a pretty good test. You know, the vehicle burned a little too early. That getting that timing right on that motor is really, really difficult. Um, and then we had a little horizontal component when we touched down, vehicle bounced, tipped over, but let's take a look at the data as well. I've got this pulled up in the MATLAB uh, plot viewer right here. Um, so we're looking at a couple of things with this. Uh, the first is this top, this top measurement right here, which is altitude. Um, we do go just a little above 30 meters in altitude. This is basically the raw altitude measurements um, and then the uh, slightly averaged measurements using a running average filter. It's, it's very, very simple averaging, um, and you can see that delay between the average and the raw measurements there. But as the vehicle comes down, you can see uh, that solid propellant motor comes up to thrust. This is an Estes F15 motor. Um, you can see that classic Estes thrust curve uh, for about uh, like three and a half seconds. You can see that massive vibration event when the legs pop out as well. Um, we've also got measurements here. I believe these are uh, global acceleration. Um, so this is uh, decoupled from the roll. These are these really tiny measurements right here. So that is the vehicle pitching back and forth and trying to make sure we're not sliding in one direction or the other. Um, and you can actually see this. Let me see if I can zoom in here. If I zoom in, this red line right here, I'll turn it on and off a few times, 
this is that horizontal, oop, what are we doing here? Nope. Uh, this is that horizontal velocity that we have at touchdown. That's that acceleration that we're that we are uh, seeing. Uh, and actually, really, I should I should be showing the acceleration, not the uh, showing the velocity, not the acceleration. My goodness, you can see we've got a little bit of that velocity at touchdown that we just weren't able to null out there. Uh, we can also take away a lot of these measurements um, and look at the TVC motion, uh, TVC X and Y here. We're not doing uh, a whole lot of gimbling of the motor. Uh, let me see if I can move around here. We're keeping it pretty much within, uh, let's say like four degrees plus and minus, or uh, rather two degrees plus and minus, four degrees total. Um, and you can see there's a little bit of steady state error, uh, it looks like on the Y, or no, the X axis, um, as we start at zero and then we sort of trend to um, maybe two or three degrees, so I must have had that axis misaligned and the rocket is correcting for that. Something you've no doubt noticed at this point is that this plot is titled Echo Landing Test September 12th, 2019. That's not a mistake, I just took a billion years to get this video done. So I figured I would run another landing test uh, before I got this video out to sort of compare how if we changed nothing on the rocket, if we didn't change the software, the settings, the uh, as much as I can control it, the weather conditions, if we changed nothing, I weighed the motors so that the, the, the amount of propellant is the same, really tried to eliminate every sort of variable in the system and test it again. Because early last year, I was on an interview with TMRO Tomorrow. This is an excellent YouTube channel. You should absolutely subscribe to them. Uh, I said uh, uh, this. Uh, we've come really close. True. It's like two meters <laughs> off the ground and it hovers and it, it just... It's so close. Um, I'm in the middle of like uh, a massive software update for the landing stuff. That's true. We're, it's like it, we're going to stick it in 2019 for sure. False. You idiot. I did not stick it in 2019. Have a look. Oof. <laughs> that is why you don't do concrete. Stop putting it in the comments. <laughs> All right, I'm kidding. Let's get this drone down. As mentioned before, I truly changed no settings between this. I weighed the motors, they had the same amount of propellant. I tried to get an igniter that had roughly the same resistance in ohms uh, as a sort of pseudo measurement for how fast the igniter would light and then light the motor. But there are so many variables in this system, and I think it's worth discussing the future of Echo with those variables in mind. The first thing to consider is that Echo is essentially running legacy code. Uh, this means all of the software was written in 2017 or 2018, and it was written with the purpose of running on Signal, the flight computer that BPS sells. The primary goal of this software is to launch a rocket and keep it straight up on the way up, uh, and not do a whole lot else, not do that horizontal control stuff. We're not talking about trying to land on the way down. There are a tremendous number of differences between keeping the rocket straight on the way up and keeping it straight on the way down without tipping over, burning the motor at the right time, measuring altitude way more accurately. And so all of the things that were built for signal don't necessarily make sense in Echo. I'm sort of going over this at a very high level, but the thing that's important to know is that a lot of Echo's code is not written super well for landing a vehicle. It's great for keeping it straight on the way up, but it's not purpose-built. And so with that in mind, there's also a bunch of stuff that needs to go right and I need to get lucky about. Um, there are a couple of major things, but here are all of them just sort of in a random list. The IMU needs to be perfectly calibrated. If the IMU doesn't understand exactly what upright is, it's, this is specifically the accelerometer measurements, you need a really good reference. You could use a horizon sensor for this, but that's more mass and it's not always accurate depending on your location. Uh, and we're also not really getting high enough above the horizon for that to be a good way to do it. Wind is always a factor. I do not have a way currently of sensing wind on the vehicle and these accelerometers that are essentially cell phone grade aren't good at doing that. The barometer, even with pretty solid filtering, has a ton of noise in it as well. I mean, some of this noise is plus or minus two meters sometimes, uh, which is not really acceptable or not really good for getting that tolerance dialed in uh, to burn the motor at the right time. When we're trying to land a model rocket with a solid propellant motor, you need milliseconds of precision, and that turns out to be, you know, 
uh, maybe like a tenth of a meter of precision uh, in order to get that burn to happen at the right time. So if your measurement system to get that tenth of a meter of precision has two meters of imprecision, it's going to be really hard to do that correctly. The TVC calibration, as we saw earlier in the video, is also pretty hard to get right. Um, there are ways to sort of aid in that, but it's very difficult to get the thrust vector control mount calibrated correctly. I don't know, slash am not allowed to say, how they calibrate thrust vector control hardware in the real space launch industry, but I can tell you this, they don't just look down the rocket and go, huh, looks about right, send it. The most obvious variable that you cannot control in this type of landing scenario is the motor's total impulse. If you have more or less propellant, if the thrust curve doesn't have the exact right shape, if you burn your motor a little too fast, if you burn it too slow, if you burn it too soon, if you burn it too late, all of these things uh, are just uncontrollable states in your state vector. And so if you can't get those dialed in, those are all gonna be variables. And that was a big one for this. You can see as the rocket is coming down, we end up landing like two or three meters above the ground here. Uh, and that's sort of when the vehicle slows down, even if it is tilted at a totally incorrect angle and moving to the side pretty fast. One that was unexpectedly difficult to dial in was the time between when the current is sent to the igniter and the time that the motor comes up to thrust. Um, after testing this in a ton of different configurations and obtaining an, an incredible amount of test data, I found this to just be really wide ranging and very difficult to dial in. It depends so heavily on exactly where the igniter is placed, exactly how the throat of the motor looks, um, and, and like 30 other factors as well. So it's very difficult to dial in the motor come up time, essentially. We're looking at the time between not even just how fast the motor burns, but how fast the motor ignites. If I were a better engineer or if I had all the time and money in the world, I don't think this is an impossible task. There seems to be nothing inherently impossible about landing a model rocket with a solid propellant motor. However, I do think it relies a whole lot on luck. I promise this is not sponsored by Audible. I know everything is, but I seriously, I promise. I've been listening to an audiobook about the development, building, and launch of the Mars Curiosity rover. Through the entirety of the book, two things become abundantly clear. One, everyone who works at JPL is absolutely a genius. And two, if your design requires luck to work, it's not a good design, and you should change it. Echo requires a tremendous amount of luck to work. I can't control the wind, I can't control the motor, I can't control like 30 other things in this system. And so by that logic, it is not a good design. If I want to propulsively land a rocket, I don't want it to be because I tried it 30 times and got lucky once. And this is an excellent segue into two different things. One, all of this is why I'm developing Sprite. I know there are a lot of people here who still aren't sure what Sprite is. If you're curious about that, there's a video in the description down below about it. The second thing is that Sprite is a Pathfinder mission, if you want to call it that. The idea is to prove all of these things out in a safe way before we move to the second part, which is liquid rockets, liquid bipropellant rockets. I'm working with my friend Daniel, um, and working with means he is building this part, but uh, we are doing a 100 lift pound LOX and methanol liquid bipropellant engine. Uh, the specs we have right now are 300 psi chamber pressure, it is film cooled in the chamber and regeneratively cooled in the nozzle. The idea is essentially I develop all the control software I need with Sprite and then we move it over to the liquid propellant lander vehicle uh, once Sprite is safely working reliably every single time. Sprite, which is flying very soon, and the liquid propellant lander, which is flying not very soon, uh, are a way for me to do this the right way. I can control every state I need with these, specifically throttle control. Um, I can fly with uh, much more powerful sensors because we have a larger payload capacity. There are so many benefits to scaling up at this point, and I'm really excited uh, to get that started with Sprite. I think we should be able to fly by the end of January, maybe early February. So all of this is to say I'm putting Echo on hold kind of in the way that Falcon Heavy is as well. I'm sure this is a bit disappointing and there are certainly some folks here who are subscribed solely because they want to see a model rocket land propulsively with a solid motor. Uh, and to those folks, if you want to unsubscribe, truly no hard feelings, it's all right, I get it. With that said, I do think this is the right choice. If I'm going to land something propulsively, I want to do it because I did the right engineering and I worked really hard for it, and not because I got lucky. It doesn't feel honest to do it and just get lucky. So hashtag Echo is over party. Let's lean into the current cancel culture and make sure we cancel the heck out of Echo. 
<laughs> I'm really kidding. Thank you very much for sticking around and supporting BPS uh, even as things change and shift and, and move around. Um, we should be back to the higher quality of videos now since we've passed January 1st. And I can't state enough how much I appreciate that people continue to follow the project even as things shift and change and move around. So, thank you again. My name is Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your winds. I can't do the thumbs up. And your winds be low. Goodbye, everyone.